Hi folks! This presentation is basically about repetitive DNA, also called redundant DNA. It's a major feature of eukaryotic genomes, though much less so in prokaryotes. We'll talk a lot about transposons, a kind of repetitive DNA that you may know as jumping genes. Repetitive DNA sequences, especially transposons, were once called junk DNA because they seemed to serve no genetic or physiological function and transposons were also once called selfish DNA because their replication seemed to have no biological purpose other than their own spread and self-perpetuation. They played a major role in evolution, shaping, and I mean literally shaping, eukaryotic genomes, including our own. Let's begin with a description of the experiments of Britton and Davidson. Let me tell you what these guys found. They started with the idea that there must be some DNA sequences in a eukaryotic genome that were in fact redundant. As examples, they could point to the genes that encode ribosomal RNAs. These were known to be repeated. To this, they could add DNA sequences near multiple different genes encoding different proteins, but that had to be turned on or off at the same time by interacting with the same regulatory factors. Also, the phenomenon of jumping genes had really been reported prior to Britton and Davidson's work. Britton and Davidson's results basically were that typical eukaryotic genomes turn out to be rich in redundant sequences. In addition to the basic double helical complementary DNA structure that we've seen, here's what we knew about DNA around the time Britton and Davidson began their work. Cesium chloride density gradient centrifugation separates eukaryotic DNA fragments into a main band of typical DNA density and a smaller satellite band of greater or lesser density depending on species. In many cases, the satellite DNA was shown by base composition analysis to contain a higher proportion of the bases adenine and thymine compared to the main band DNA. For a few species, the satellite DNA was richer in guanine and cytosine. As we've already noted, there was the expectation that some DNA sequences were, by their nature, redundant. So here's the basic experiment. DNA is fragile and shears naturally during extraction. But high molecular weight extracts could be made to shear to more uniform size fragments, say 10 kilobase pair fragments like those illustrated here. The expedient is really very simple. You take the high molecular weight DNA that you've extracted and you force it under constant pressure through a fine gauge needle at the end of a syringe and that will shear the DNA down to pretty much uniform lengths. The sheared fragments were then heated to 100 degrees Celsius to break the hydrogen bonds and separate or denature the DNA strands. Then the mixture was cooled to 60 degrees to allow separated strands to find and reanneal to their complements. This curve shows the rate of the formation or reformation of double-stranded DNA fragments at 60 degrees when this experiment was done with rat DNA extracts. Time on the x-axis is in log units so the data actually taken over days or even weeks could fit on this graph. The data is multiphasic as if there were three classes of rat DNA based on how rapidly each class could reform double strands after they'd been denatured. Let's talk about what these classes or groups of DNA could be. Imagine in a tube full of rat DNA fragments that 15 to 20 percent of the DNA in the tube consists of many copies of the same sequence. About 25 to 40 percent of the DNA consists of sequences that are repeated but less so than the fastest annealing fraction, that is to say the moderately redundant or repetitive sequences. The remaining DNA, a much smaller percentage overall, taking the longest time to find their complements, must then be sequences that are unique or repeated only a few times in the genome and therefore they anneal or renature much later. In fact, we can think of a tube full of eukaryotic DNA fragments as consisting of a pretty high concentration of highly repeated sequences that find each other and reanneal pretty quickly followed by a large fraction of moderately repeated DNA and a very small, relatively speaking, small fraction or small concentration of unique sequence DNA or nearly unique sequence DNA. The bottom line here, repeated DNA sequences are indeed a large proportion of the eukaryotic genome. 
The curve shown here is the reassociation kinetics of extracted fragmented bacterial DNA. The curve consists only of one class of DNA. But is this class repetitious DNA? Asking this question is like asking whether all of the DNA in a bacterial genome, whether all of that DNA is in fact repeated so that the circle consists of two copies of each gene or three copies of each gene. We know from gene mapping studies that the E. coli genes are located they map one after the other on the circular chromosome. And in fact, there's only one copy of each gene per genome. So what this curve is really telling us is that prokaryotic DNA has few, if any, repeated sequence DNA fragments. That shouldn't be surprising since the prokaryotic genome is pretty small, containing not much more DNA than is actually needed to encode the genes required for survival. Here's the evidence. Ah, I meant to ask this as a question, but I've already given you the answer. That's okay.